don't develop, you don't find anything about yourself unless you leave home. When you leave home, when you go away and you're on your own, you find out who you are and you find out things about yourself that you can't find out at home. There's a psychic process that takes place when you travel. It, it, you develop when you travel. When you can't travel the world, you can always read a Paul Theroux novel. Theroux has literally traveled the world, inspiring a prolific collection of 52 books to date. And several of his novels have made it to the silver screen. I'm sorry. I'm happy. We're free. The Mosquito Coast. Sometimes, twice. Everything's complicated, but there's always a solution. Theroux's most recent novel, Under the Wave at Waimea, is an atmospheric novel following a big wave surfer as he confronts aging, privilege, mortality, and whose lives we choose to remember. Catching a wave tonight with Theroux is Spokesman Review Editor Rob Curley. Please welcome Paul Theroux to our Northwest Passages virtual stage. All right, Paul, thank you so much for, for joining us. I'm, 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 I'm just sad you couldn't make the trip to Spokane just to see how beautiful it is here. Uh, I, I think you'd enjoy it. I'm, I'm sorry I can't make it. My hair looks weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that same problem every day. Um, <laughs> I, I will. Um, I'll. I'll um, pay you a visit sometime soon. I, I sure the sooner hope so. the better. I'd like. To I, I, I agree. Yeah. So so, for, I can't wait to talk to you about about the book. So so let let's get started right right in. So so one of the things that's so clear uh, from from the book is. The knowledge of surfing and, and that surfing lifestyle, it, it almost feels like you must live in Hawaii. I'm speaking to you from Hawaii at this <laughs> moment. And the picture, you showed a picture of Waimea Bay. It's actually down the hill from where I am right now. Um, and it's a sunny day, and it's it looks like that at this moment. So, yes, aloha from the 50th state. And... Um, the book is is set not only here in Hawaii but right here on the North Shore. So that, let's let's talk about that surfing culture. You you write about it so smartly, and, and it really takes you in. Is, is that because of, of the life you've lived in in, in uh, Waimea? I live near a town called Haleiwa. Waimea uh, is a bay uh, of, of historic um, associations. Uh, Captain Cook's men stopped here. Captain Cook had died before then. Um, I was murdered before then. Vancouver, the uh, explorer of Vancouver, stopped right here. I've lived here for 30 years, and I, I live in a, in a culture of water people, watermen, amphibians, surfers, paddlers, canoeists, swimmers, snorkelers, kayakers, and those are the people that I talk to most of the time. Not readers, but reading isn't everything. I'm sure you you wouldn't agree with that. But um, I very rarely talk about books with them, but we talk about the weather, we talk about surf conditions. And I got very interested in this whole culture, which is a kind of a gypsy culture. It has its own rules, its own language. They're great travelers, actually, surfers. And so we talk about places that I couldn't talk about with anyone else. I mean, they go to Indonesia surfing. They go to Mexico. They go to Tahiti. They travel everywhere, South Africa, um, where are they? Portugal, Nazare, the biggest wave in the world, so all of that. So those are the people. Um, that's my society, such as it is. And a previous book of mine is called Hotel Honolulu, and that was set... 40 miles from here in Honolulu. Uh, there you are. Um, that I published that book in, actually 20 years ago. And so this, the book that I have now is the other side of this island of Oahu. 
And when I got here, I really wanted to know more about surf culture. I'm not a surfer myself, although I paddle an outrigger canoe. And I thought it was very interesting. The way people live, the way the, 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 the waves break in, in different places. And here, you know, the, you, you might say, oh, that there's waves everywhere. Every wave has a name. Every little, you know, half mile or surf break has a name. Out to sea, sometimes there's a, a, a shore break or an inner break, and then there's outside break. So the sea is a is a very interesting place. It all it's all um, mapped and recorded and has names, and that that interested me a lot. That wasn't that didn't give me the idea for the book, but it made me want to write about um, the place that I live in. So Joe, Joe Sharkey. So th this character, he uh, in the book, uh, we we have the famous quote from Duke about uh, "Out of water, I am nothing." With Joe's advice to surfers being in the water, you're somebody special. So so what is it for you? Are you the Duke or the Joe? Oh, I, I I'm uh, <laughs> I'm both really. Although I will say, there's a you know the ancient Phoenicians in the Eastern Mediterranean had a belief that every day you spend on the water was not deducted from your life. So the notion of spending as much time as you can in the water is uh, rejuvenating. And so I'm not as old as I look. Uh, my, my, I, I've deducted all those uh, days off. Obviously I can't write in the water, but I often write at the beach. So I'm, I, I can't say out of the water I'm nothing. Out of the water I'm a I'm a semi well known writer. <laughs> in the water <laughs> I'm a I'm anonymous. I mean people in the water are anonymous. But I go paddling with a group of men, Hawaiians, and we have the greatest time. We don't talk about books. We talk about uh, the water, the water conditions. Can you do that? And uh, we go out. We sometimes surf smaller waves, those sort little of bumping waves. So I love it. I, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, or near Boston, Massachusetts. I'm a coastal New Englander. I moved from there to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, on the, on the, near the shore there. Uh, I lived in England for a long time, but everyone in England is near the water. You're, in England, you're never less than, or never more than 65 miles from the ocean. So. I've always been near the sea. I've never, I've never lived in Middle America. I've never lived um, in a place that was, except when I was in Africa long ago. Uh, I've always tried to live near the water. Well, I find water very vitalizing. I love marine sunlight, and like the main character in the book, um, who he 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 lives for getting out, getting on the water, and 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 living his life. One of the worst things about being a writer is that you have to do it at home in a room like that. It's a lovely room, but you know, you're, you're kind of a hostage to your desk. And I hate that. I really hate it. I always have hated it. Uh, uh, but what are you going to do? I mean, um, you cope with it. But as soon as my work is done, I leave the house and I sometimes go and I write on the beach. I have a folding chair. I sit in the chair and I write. And it might seem an odd thing to do, but I've got, I wrote a lot of this book just looking at the waves, sitting on the beach, anonymous, no interruptions, just looking. And um, I write in longhand and it works, it worked very well. When I've finished uh, a book in longhand, then I sometimes rewrite it, parts of it in longhand, and ultimately I type it. So it's a long, process but i do try to do it outside as much as possible you talk about it being a long process how long does it take you to typically write a book and is it different between fiction and nonfiction? it is different i started this book eight years ago um and i w i got to a certain point in it and we had a very xenophobic uh head of state president in the white house began denigrating mexicans so I was working on the book, actually, and I, I was getting to the end of a part, and I was listening to all this stuff about Mexicans, 
rapists, murderers invading, coming over the border. And this to a lot of that. And I thought, I'm a traveler. I can speak Spanish. Um, I might be able to do a service to the public at large, the reading public anyway, by going to Mexico. So I stopped writing this book on the wave at, under the wave at Waimea. I bought uh, a secondhand car and I drove from Cape Cod, Massachusetts to McAllen, Texas. I went via Houston and then McAllen. McAllen's right on the border. Uh, and then I went up and down the border and then back to Macau, to Tijuana, then back to Matamoros, and then to McAllen. And then I drove across the border, got papers, got insurance and all that. I drove my car to Reynosa. Reynosa is a dangerous place. The town of Reynosa, the plaza of Reynosa is okay, not too bad, but there's a, a drug war going on at the moment, a cartel war. I didn't have a problem. I drove then to Monterrey and then to uh, Saltillo and then San Luis Potosí and onward back to, down to Mexico City. I got to Mexico City, I taught for a while, then I went back to Houston, left my car with a friend, came to Hawaii and worked on this book for a while. Then I went back to Houston, got the car, drove into Mexico and I drove around Mexico. I did that for about a year and a half and then wrote the book. Your question is, what is it, what's the length of time that you, of writing a, a travel book to a novel. A novel is an indeterminate amount of time. You don't know how long it's going to take. I started a novel last May, April 1st when the pandemic hit. I thought I want to do something useful. Obviously I'm going to have to stay home. Um, so I'll, I started as a short story. It's now a novel. I don't know whether, maybe it's half done. Maybe it's a bit more than that. With a travel book, Every day with a travel book, I take notes. I write down everything that happened that day. A dialogue, um, every every uh, encounter that I've had, uh, and I take elaborate notes. It's a, and, and so at the end of a trip, I usually have four or five or six thick notebooks and all written in longhand. And I base the book on that. The Great Railway Bazaar, I wrote in about three or four months. It doesn't seem like much, but... I had written the whole book. The, the, when I came back, I had the book in my hand as a kind of rough draft. So I just, I typed it. And I've never spent a lot of time writing a travel book. I've never had writer's block. Yeah, you know, I've got the, the notebook open. I mean, how could I not have, a, how could I have a problem? You sit down, you say, well, what happened then? Well, I say I was in Mexico City. And then you, I'm, I'm transcribing my very, detailed notes, dialogue and everything like that. With a novel, you don't know quite where you are. So I, I find myself um, sitting down at my desk every morning thinking, where am I? What am I doing now? Uh, what happened yesterday when I was writing? And I look over my notes and then I, I squeeze it out. I, I write. And sometimes I have a burst of activity and I can write a lot. Other times I write then I rewrite, then I recopy the page. And sometimes four or five times I recopy it. Um, but, but it moves on. I mean, I've been writing seriously uh, since about 1963, uh, when I was, first went to Africa and had something to write about. So I have a method, and the method seems to work for me. I don't have a job. I'm not a writer in residence. I never got a MacArthur grant. I never got a Guggenheim. I never got a Fulbright. I, with the Mosquito Coast you alluded to earlier, I was thinking the other day, somebody asked me about it. And I forgot to say that when I wrote that book, this thing here, um, I didn't have an advance from a publisher. I wrote it. It took me two years. For two years, I was in London. I was working on the book and I had no income. <laughs> I just said, I applied for Guggenheim, but I was turned down. I don't know why, they didn't like me. <laughs> I didn't think I was up to bunch. Didn't, not a promising writer. I did not get it. And, and I thought, when I, could, when I got turned down, I thought I'm never going to apply for a grant again. But I was happy writing the book. I, and then to write the book, I had to do book reviews to make a living. And then in the middle of writing The Mosquito Coast, I went to China for a month and went down the Yangtze River. 
but I was still writing a book. In other words, I'm a professional writer. Uh, I make my living by writing. I don't have any other income. I don't, or, or let's say I don't, I, when I was writing this, of course, they, I've, I've had films made subsequently. But when I started out, all my income was from um, writing the, the books that I was writing, and then from people would make a, a suggestion, say, "Do you want to write about I don't know your favorite piece of luggage? Do you want to write? Do you want to go to Corsica? Write about that. Do you want to write about?" Skiing? Do you want to write about going to Ireland? Do you want to write about a, a review a book by Yukio Mishima? By the way, it's four books by Yukio Mishima. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I never turned down any reasonable offer. I never even turned down many unreasonable offers. <laughs> but so uh, uh, I took them. So when I was in the middle of under the wave at my mayor, that I guess is the point I'm making. I felt I wanted to write a book about Mexico. I knew that. If I spent a year or a year and a half driving around Mexico in my own car, that when I came back, I would have a book and I would be able to, I would, I, I would be able to delineate life in Mexico and maybe destroy the stereotype of who Mexicans are, what they do. It's not one person. It's a very complicated, multiracial, multi-layered, fascinating place, uh, uh, Mexico. It's amazing. And the Mexicans that I knew, the friends that I made were among the best friends I've ever made traveling. I came back, I finished the book. When I finished the book, it was, um, I guess, two summers ago, I resumed Under the Wave at Waimea. And it was a good thing because when I was in Mexico, I visited Todos Santos, a surf spot. I went to Puerto Escondido. Uh, that's a surf spot. I met surfers. So I was, and I was thinking about the book. And, you know, with my left hand making notes, but mainly I was interested in Mexico. And so when you say, how long does it take? You know, it depends. It's a, I'm giving you a rather involved answer, but it's because I have no other um, means of support. So I have to do what I feel in my heart is necessary to do. And I thought this novel can wait, but a book about Mexico should not wait. It should not wait. But anyway, so, so, and I've done that, you know, I wrote about China in the same spirit. I wrote about Africa in the same spirit, just feeling this is something I want to do. But I know that if I take the trip, four or five months on the trip, or it, might, it might be a year, then when I come back, three or four months, I'll have the book. So that, 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 that's, that's a sure thing. It sounds right, kind of cold-blooded, but why should a travel book take more than that? You don't, you know, you know what you're writing about, You've come back, you're in the bosom of your family, everyone's fine, you know, my wife is cooking and I'm eating and I'm sleeping in my own bed and I'm just, you know, it's heaven, really. It's not like, the trip itself can be quite testing, you know, and <laughs> death-defying, but actually um, working at home is, is a pleasure. So that's, all my writing life, I've, I've worked both in nonfiction and fiction, short stories, novels, uh, and and travel and that has been my living a very satisfying very fulfilling life when I hear people complain about it I think you know I a writer complaining about uh, how hard it is I think you know here's a person who doesn't have any idea of what real work is like real work is having a boss, it's very difficult, it can be dangerous, you might be away from your family, maybe you're underpaid, you know, you might have just a service job, flipping burgers or whatever it is, maybe you just lost your job. For a writer, I mean, a writer is in heaven. And then sometimes you say, it's a writer in residence, what's the problem? I, I mean, I really don't have any patience with writers who complain. None, none. I have no, I think you shouldn't complain, you're, you're daring the fates, and someday you'll find out what a real job is like, and a real job is really hard. Because I've had them. I've had difficult jobs, and I hated them. So, so there you are. Our, in our at Northwest Passages at our book club for this newspaper, our readers are very involved. And while you were talking about uh, the Mosquito Coast, one of our, our, our readers, uh, Ellen, uh, no, is, is Rick. Rick wanted to know your opinion of the Harrison Ford version of Mosquito Coast. 
I thought it was very good. I, I thought he was good. I think Peter Weir is an excellent director. Uh, the script um, varies uh, uh, somewhat from the book itself, but not in a bad way. I'm, Peter Weir saw something that I hadn't seen. He saw Harrison Ford has a foil. The foil is the Reverend. There's a missionary down there. He's called the Reverend Gurney Spellgood. So he, he saw them as in opposition. And so the film is really about those two guys. The book is not about that. The book is uh, the father, Ali Fox, against the elements and dragging his family deeper and deeper into the jungle. And so I was happy with the film. And I can add to that that um, there's a TV version. Apple Films has made a TV version of it, which is coming out the end of this month, which is the first season is seven episodes. My nephew's in it, actually. Justin Theroux, and that's different also, but it's updated. It has the spirit of the book, but it, there's a lot of, I mean, it starts off in a very kind of bang, bang, uh, people escaping, uh, people, Ali Fox is being pursued by the government. And, and it's very exciting. I saw, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an executive producer. I didn't hire Justin. Justin was hired, got the, the job, honestly. But uh, again, that's, that's different. You know, it's a great thing when your work is made into films. I, I would never say, well, J.T. Salinger said, I'll never allow my uh, Catcher in the Ride to be made into a film. He absolutely refused. Samuel Beckett did want Waiting for Godot to be made into a film, although he did made it. He made a short film with Buster Keaton. He was very against films. He very Beckett very strict about his work transformed to the screen. So some people have resisted it. I don't resist it. I think it's a great thing. Two things happen. One is people see it and they read. They, they're inspired to read the book. How many people say, well, I saw this film, whatever it may be, Madame Bovary, Anna Karenina, Mosquito Coast, and I read the book. And, they say, and they're kind of interested in... in uh, debating how true it is the book and the other thing is you make a living i mean there's revenue from it so you can keep body and soul together you don't have to uh scrimp and save and it allows the writer to go on and write more so it's an inspiration and you know it's and it's income so i don't know why anyone complains about it i mean i i'm, I'm i would never say well you spoiled my book unless it was really bad but i mean about Five films have been made from things that I've written, and I've been happy with all of them. I, 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 nothing. Could, Peter Bogdanovich made my novel Saint Jack into a film with Ben Gazzara. He actually made it in Singapore, and that was a great experience. I helped with the script, and Saint Jack, the film, depicts a Singapore that no longer exists. If you see that film, you'd see, you, you're looking at a Singapore that Joseph Conrad would recognize because it hadn't changed from the time Conrad was there in the 1890s, but the buildings, the river, the, the, old, this, um, the, old, uh, uh, the, the Maidan, the cricket ground, a lot of the buildings still existed, uh, existed from Conrad's time. And then Singapore was modernized. So you look at St. Jack, the book, is also set, it's set in the 60s, it's set when I was there, 1968, 69. And um, so it's it's dated, you might say, but it's also, you know, it has a lot of period, I hope, charm and historical value. So I don't have a complaint about Peter Weir or any of the people who've done it. They've all, I've, I've, I've had nothing but good experiences with films. I mean, you're looking at the, the people I don't know what you think. I, I publish a lot of books. You're looking at a very fulfilled, happy guy. I don't have any complaints about publishing, about films or anything. I just get on with my work and um, do the best I can. But I've really, I've had a very um, fortunate career. And um, the fact that my books are in print and I'm still at it. You know, I turned 80 the other day. Who wants to turn 80? Anyone in the audience? <laughs> Raise your hand if you want to be 80. I would say no hands showing, right? So, uh, but I'm still at it. So um, uh, that's what I'm happy about. 
Wrong. So you you earlier talked about how the surfers that you you interact with at at home uh, aren't are big readers, and and neither is the main character at, in your book. Uh, J- Joe Sharkey's not reading a lot of books, yet his his buddy is Hunter S. Thompson, and and I'm not trying to spoil anything here, but the, the way that that the way Hunter S. Thompson is written is written in a way that it feels like you had met him or you had or did you just research him that it's a great character in the book can you tell us about that i knew hunter s thompson i was quite friendly with him he used to come to hawaii once or twice a year he wrote about the marathon uh he first wrote for rolling stone about the marathon and then espn uh he was a, a very complicated guy but <laughs> And, and and he was very um, uh, jumpy. He said, "You know, it's a lot of work to be an addict. It's a full-time job to be an addict." So he was he he didn't inject, but he cocaine or whiskey or weed, whatever it was. I mean, he needed to stimulate himself. And um, it, but he he loved Hawaii, and he also loved athletes. He loved athleticism. He was passionate about football, not so much baseball, but marathon, running, football, surfing. He, he was a bit of a um, hydrophobic person, didn't go near the water, but he, 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 he was stoked by just seeing guys on the water. And, and he liked me. And, you know, I loved his work. Uh, so we got along very well. I mean, he was a prickly guy at times, and he had a lot of health issues. He was also at the end of his writing career. He had, his great period really was much earlier. It was maybe in the 70s, um, and then he went into decline, partly self-destructive decline, but actually he, his writing actually didn't, serve him as well as it, later as it did earlier. And he knew that. He got very depressed about that. And when he got to a point where his health had deteriorated, the point where he, he needed a walker and he had a hip replacement, the football season was over. Um, he could, his writing had, had, had deteriorated to the point where, uh, I mean, his uh, drug use had, had increased. He just, he just took the samurai way out and he killed himself. And he called all his friends and said, you know, nice knowing you. Um, we had a great time. He called. He didn't call me. He called me earlier. I saw him here, and I knew he. I knew that he. He was kind of on his way out, but. He was the perfect friend, for the man that I'm writing about. He didn't really care whether you read his books or not. What he wanted was. Action, physicality. You know, athleticism. He wanted drugs, magic mushrooms. Well, they grow right near here. I mean, I could go down the road right now. There's a meadow where there are cows, and there's magic mushrooms growing, growing um, on the cow pads. So you take them, and I'm not that interested in drugs, to tell you the truth. I've, I've taken a number of them, and they do nothing for me. Uh, but anyway, and the other thing he was interested in was guns. So who's shooting? But we... Uh, I. I took him to a, a gun range here, and we had a great time just shooting. I mean, that was his fun. Shoot a gun, take a drug, and writing. I mean, he writing, he always said, it's it's better than sex, uh, writing. I'm just going to turn my phone off. Um, it's better than sex. One of his books is called Better Than Sex. And politics to a certain extent. I mean, he was kind of a political junkie. Of a kind, but he was an amazing guy. And he also had a side that was very quiet, kind of shy, not timid, but, but shy, kind of oblique. And I thought that was interesting. And so he gets to know, so he and Sharky, the main character in my book, get along very well. I mean, it's a mutual, uh, mutual aberration, although he gives Sharky a book and Sharky says, what am I gonna do with it? He thinks, what a burden this is. It's a book, I'm gonna have to read it, I'm not gonna read it. Books in Hawaii get very mildewed. You know, I'm going to put it in and I'm going to look at it. And oh, my God. You know, a non-reader sees a book either as something magical 
and like, it's a book. How amazing. It's a book. You know, I'm illiterate, but it's an amazing book. And I felt this in Africa. I lived among people who couldn't read. And then when they saw a book, they were jazzed by it. It's a book. You know, like, amazing. Or they think it's a burden. Like, what am I going to do with it? Well, you could read it, but I don't know many readers here. I'm sure they're here, you know, in Hawaii. I'm sure they're here. But, I mean, I'm speaking to you from the North Shore of Oahu, but um, I haven't, we have an NPR station here. I, I haven't been to the station. There's a PBS station. I haven't done that. There's a newspaper. I haven't done that. I mean, I live in complete obscurity. So Spokane, you know, thank you very much for being interested in my, <laughs> my work and my life and whatever. It's, 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 it's pleasant. And Sharky feels the same thing, that he's, he's remote from it. So I can relate to that. I can, I can relate to it. He's also, the book is about aging. It's about being an old surfer, an aging surfer. So he, I, I can relate to every aspect of his, of his life, really. That brings up a, a great point. Aging is a key, a key part of this book. And, and I, I, it makes me want to know what, what has aging taught you? I mean, what, what are the lessons of, uh, of your life that, that have changed as you've aged? It's very interesting. If you're a traveler, and you, the aging traveler is different from the young traveler. The, 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 an older traveler is a, is a more cautious, more patient person. The, um, a younger person is more reckless and more likely to have a problem. People regard you differently. In Mexico, for example, I'm a hombre de juicio. I'm a man of judgment. This is the great thing about Mexico. They respect older people. I'm not just some old gringo, old gabacho. I'm I'm a man of judgment. I and and I get I'm Don Pablo, and people they're, they're deferential. A young person will jump up and give me. My, his seat it doesn't happen in the states, so the, in some in some countries you get respect for being old, and in this country not so much. You're not a consumer, you know. What are you buying? You know, the, the ads are aimed at the young, at the consumer, at the people with money, people before retirement, people you know, bouncing around, living their lives. Um, no one's aiming. At, maybe they're selling you. Um, Depends or Viagra or something like that, but this is a certain market for Depends um, or I don't know canes or walkers or wheelchairs. That's all. That's all we're good for. But actually, an old in in, in many countries, an older person is someone who is uh, respected. In in Hawaiian culture, I'm a kupuna. I'm a, I'm a respected elder. Sometimes here I'm I'm regarded as a kupuna, a respected elder other times i'm just an old geezer but uh, aging itself uh, you you look you take the long view as an older person think what you've seen i mean so i i, I grew up i was born in 1941 i knew I, the echoes of the first of the second world war were around i remember um the soviet union threatening us vietnam civil rights movement the death of emmett till I was 14 years old. I was the same age as Emmett Till when he was lynched. I remember that, and uh, in, in in the mid 50s. So, all of these episodes in a long life are, are reference points. You meet a younger person, and you say, "I mean, now and then, I, I I sometimes refer to Bill Clinton or or Kennedy, and, and no one has a clue." I joined the Peace Corps in 1963. Actually, I joined more or less around the time. Kennedy was assassinated. Who remembers that? Just, you know, I often meet people who don't have a clue about that. So it can be frustrating and that, and people say, you know what we should do? We should do that. And I think, and a lot of older people will agree with me, we tried that. It didn't work. We tried to win that war. It didn't work. We lost, you know, in Vietnam or whatever it is. We're, we're drawing from Afghanistan. No one ever won in Afghanistan. I've been to Afghanistan. I went to Afghanistan in 1973 and I thought, Every man and boy I've seen in this country carries a rifle. Who could win here? No one. Everyone had, they were old fashioned rifles, but everyone had one. I was on a bus. Everyone had, a, every guy had a rifle. Well, have you ever been to a country where everyone carried a rifle? Well, Afghanistan is one of those places. And they were all Enfield rifles. Later, they had AK-47s. How do you win? 
and they're their country. So you would say, well, maybe we haven't tried hard enough. Let's stay in Afghanistan. A waste of time. When we went there, when Bush declared, you know, he was going to go in and 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 win, uh, it's a non-starter. You will live a long time, and you know, it's a mistake. This is a mistake. And people say, why? How do you know that? Well, I've been there. We tried it. It didn't work, you know. And so I'm not. I don't want to be. I, I told you so, person. But uh, it, to take the long view, if you, you you're asking about old age, that's something that's quite helpful. You, the, it, well, I'm talking about experience. And uh, um, Mao Zedong, who I will quote, I'm not approving him, but he said, "All genuine knowledge." originates in direct experience. I mean, probably other people have said that, but all genuine knowledge direct. So if you've had years of experience, you have a lot of genuine knowledge because you, it, it's hands on, you know? So um, that's helpful that being older is a blessing in some respects, in that respect, but uh, try to get someone to listen to you. I mean, they, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, that's another story. But anyway, well, the, I don't the, want to sound like an old fogey, but... No, no, you, the, you brought up a, a great point I, I want, wanted to ask you. You talked about the difference between the, the a young person traveling and an older person traveling. Should people in their 70s and 75, 80, do, do, do you say, yeah, you should still go out and travel? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Don't stay home. Don't stay home. Don't get out of the house. I mean, I, I would say, so we're talking about what... A, if you're healthy, if you're reasonably healthy, if you're if you're not on some, you know, you're not handicapped in some way, or have to, or some medication that makes it impossible. Yeah, get out there. I would say, go, go, definitely go, because I mean, the only thing the drawback is it's expensive to travel. But where would I go? I mean. Mexico is full of American expatriates. That's the, that's the other contradiction of, let's say, Mexicans coming over the border, Mexicans in America, ain't it terrible? Go to Mexico. There's whole communities of Mormons in Chihuahua, Canadians near Puerto Vallarta. I mean, thousands of Canadians, if you can imagine such a thing. All there, happy as Larry. Americans there, Germans there, they're all there, all gringos, little gringo communities all over. Mexicans don't complain. They say, you know, bienvenido, welcome. <laughs> what can we do for you? So um, if I was an old, yeah, my advice is do it. There's places where maybe it might be a little tricky. India. Uh, it, it's not an easy place to travel in. But you could do it. I mean, Indians travel, older Indians travel. It's only getting there, I think. The other thing, which I highly recommend, but I think I'm not the first person to say this is get in your car, drive some way. Someone it was a, I was on a podcast um, not too long ago and the guy was complaining that he had students that wanted to go to Bangkok and some work study thing or find out about Thai culture. And I said, you're in Albuquerque, get in your car, get your students in a van, drive to the border, walk across the border. It's a different country. It's a different language. It's a different culture. You don't have to go to Bangkok to experience foreignness or this country. I wrote a book called Deep South. I got in my car and I, I always want to travel around the South, the back roads of the South. And I drove to South Carolina, drove around, Georgia, drove around, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, drove around in eccentric circles. That's the book. The picture is Steve McCurry took that picture on the front cover. And I discovered things about this country that I had no idea about. For one thing, Allendale County in South Carolina is the third poorest county in the United States. Go there, it looks like Zimbabwe. It's very poor, it's very beat up, but the people, there's good people there. It's just very poor and overlooked. People say, oh, I've been to South Carolina, I went to Hilton Head, Charleston, ain't it great? You say, yeah, yeah, get in your car, drive an hour west, and you will see something you've never seen in your life, the Delta. Um, all the way up the Delta, the Blues Highway from, you know, from basically New Orleans, but up through uh, Natchez, Vicksburg, up Clarksdale, uh, 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 Cleveland, 
up to Memphis. It's strange. It's very poor. But I, I went to music festivals there. I met people there, wonderful people. But it's a, it's a place apart. Politicians don't campaign there. No one helps the people there. The, the, uh, Arkansas, an amazing place, very dysfunctional. Clinton was governor for almost 12 years. What's it like there? It's like another world. The Ozarks, like another world. And, and the, the, the literacy, it has, uh, there are counties where there's 25% literacy, there's child hunger. You don't have to go to Kenya to save Africa. You can, you know, people could go to the South and lots of places in the South that could use some aid or charity or uplift. Um, so those are places to see. You could you see them in your car. We're lucky to live in a country where you get on the road and five o'clock, five thirty in the afternoon, set off from Spokane, go south, go, I would say go southeast. And at 5.30, you're going to see a sign, motel, vacancy. You can stay there. There'll be a restaurant. It may not be a, you know, a gourmet restaurant, but you'll, you'll have a place to eat. You can go. You can read a book. You can watch TV, get in the car the next day, keep going. It's, I don't know of another country where that's – Canada, maybe. Europe, not so much. I mean, Europe is kind of congested. But we have big open spaces, so there's a lot of freedom to travel. And an older person – because that's your original question. An older person could do that. Um, and I highly recommend it. Get away from, get away from the house. Get the, so I drove from, I, I would just say, I drove from Boston, Massachusetts to Pasadena last Thanksgiving in six days, 500 miles a day. Total gas bill, the price of gas, $210 from 3,000 miles. $210, huh? Yep. So, so I, we just got a question from Sylvia who said she's reading Deep South right now and she loves it. And she wants to know how you feel that book could inform us during these times of conflict in our nation. I think you could find out a lot about where we were, um, what, what a, a, a lot of this anger, indignation is coming from on both sides, both um, from whites who feel disenfranchised, whites in the South feeling they lost the Civil War, that the Civil Rights Movement was a kind of a, a, a war. They feel, many people feel, we lost it because they, they kept it up. Uh, with African Americans, they feel uh, that they're overlooked. And so both sides feel overlooked. They feel as if the culture is being ignored. I got a lot of stick from people say you're a Yankee, you know, fighting the Civil War. That's that's quite funny to me. That, uh, but I, I listened. I thought, you're still fighting. No one in the North ever talks about the Civil War, but people in the South, of course, it's on their mind. But how does it inform you? It will show you how deprived, how disenfranchised, and how overlooked and forgotten a lot of people feel. And, how, and, and what do you do about that? You see, I mean, Barack Obama went to Selma, Mississippi, Selma, Alabama, Selma, Alabama, to see the, the Pettis, Edmund Pettus Bridge. He went on the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement. So, okay, great. And he had his picture taken, and Michelle was there, and uh, John Lewis was there, and it's, it was wonderful. They, they were at the bridge. But he didn't look at Selma. I wrote about Selma, not in that book, but in, in, a, in a later piece. Selma is a very unemployed, very poor very neglected place. The bridge is, has historical significance. But my question was, the bridge is only part of Selma. What are, what are, what are voting uh, voting rights like? What are, what are voting amounts like in Selma? You don't just go there for a photo op. I mean, I loved Obama. I thought he was a great president and so forth. But if someone like of that sensitivity is going just to have his picture taken on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, he's missing the point. And if you go a little bit down the road from Selma, you come to Monroeville, Alabama, and that's where uh, To Kill a Mockingbird is set. And, and that's where Harper Lee was born and died. And that's another story too, a place with a lot of grievances, with a black section, a white section, and a history of confrontation. So, you know, not just To Kill a Mockingbird, but since then, a lot more. So there's a lot to see and a lot to understand 
And the people who pretend to, you know, it's a political thing, go give a speech, get your picture taken. But if you're a writer or a traveler, as many people watching this are, you get a deeper understanding. You're not looking for votes, you're looking for understanding. And yeah. um, I felt that going there. So uh, I have to ask, so, so on uh, yesterday we ran this big map of all of the places y your books have been, and uh, which made me wonder, um, when, when Joe Sharkey in this book needs to find himself, you, you, uh, you sent him to Arkansas. I'm trying to understand, what, what was the significance of Arkansas there? Well, that's interesting that you should say that, because it, it, it's a place I got to know pretty well. It's kind of, there are buried communities there. And the guy, he kills a man, he hits a guy on a bicycle, a homeless man on a bike. And people say, who, you know, who was it? He said, well, I, I hit a drunk homeless guy, he doesn't know who he is. And then things go wrong in his life. He has to find the man. He finds that the man came from Arkansas. So he goes there. And, and his trip to Arkansas is informed, of course, I don't write about places I've never been. You know, <laughs> sit around thinking, gee, I'll invent India or I'll invent, I went to India, I'll invent Africa. Well, I lived in Africa. I don't invent places. I, they're based on firsthand knowledge. And I thought it'd be interesting if this guy that he killed came from Arkansas, left, joined the army on the GI Bill, went to um, college in California and uh, it's Santa Cruz, uh, started a software company, made a lot of money, came to Hawaii to surf, and then fell into drugs and then became a homeless man. But he wasn't. I mean, he said, has this tremendous life, the man that he's looking for. And you find that out when you read the book. So, yeah. So he went there and he went to a place called Floristan. It's somewhat based on Harrison, Arkansas, which is in the north. Um, but I didn't. It, it's, a, it's a fictitious place. But, but the language in it, the scenes in it, the culture in it is... The Arkansas that I knew. So there you are. I mean, uh, uh, it's Arkansas are my Hawaii novel. So I, I, when we first started posting that, that we were, we were going to talk with you, I, I got a, a text message from from uh, 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 an acquaintance. His name is Stephen Pastis, and I don't know if you know who he is, but he re produces the comic uh, uh, Pearls Before Swine. And it, uh, it's very popular. It's in thousands of newspapers across America. And he said, you have to tell him that he is your biggest fan. He loves you. And during the, the pandemic, he read six of your travel books in a row. And then uh, and I said, well, you have to ask him a question. And he said, okay, here's my question. Your books have allowed me to feel like I was traveling in this year without travel. So my question is, what are the top three travel adventures are re remaining on your bucket list? So that's from our friend, Stephen. Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Well, first, uh, Stephen, I can see his artwork in the background. That's great. I mean, so he's the man. He's the man. Uh, yeah. And he has a big audience and he draws brilliantly. And on my bucket list, well, I, I have a lot of, of places, but he asked for the top three. First, I like going back to places. I would like to go back. I first, in 1963, I was in Central Africa at a little school. Now, I wrote about this in Dark Star Safari going back, but that was 20 years ago. I would like to go back to the first place that um, I lived in where I was teaching in Africa. It's, it was 3 million people when I lived there. It's now 19 million people, and 1 million of them are orphans uh, because of AIDS, of disease, uh, uh, for whatever reason. It has a very, very large percentage of the population have no mother or father. So that's a place that I'd like to go. I'd like to go to Cambodia. I've been to Cambodia before, but I'm very interested in, in Khmer art, and I would like to see that. And then I'd like to go to a place that I've never been, but I've read a lot about, Greenland. So I'm a kayaker, and the idea of going to Green, Green, Greenland, people devise their own watercraft, a, a particular kind of, um, there's a man, by the way, in Portland called uh, Harvey Goldstein. And H Harvey is the authority on kayaks in uh, ki Greenland and, and Alaska and everywhere. And he's got a kayak museum. So um, Harvey wrote two books about that. 
and I read both of them, but the, the varieties of kayaking. So uh, Malawi, Cambodia, Greenland. But if you're asking me, what's my favorite place? It's home. It's what you see here. I mean, I'm, I'm in Hawaii. I have my wife. I have chickens. I get geese. I, you know, I'm very contented life here. And it, you could get a glimpse of it. This weekend, there's a program called CBS Saturday Morning. And I'm on it this weekend, so you'll get a glimpse of what it's like. But I'm glad um, to be asked the question, as far as the bucket list goes, there are places, I love going back to places to see what happened, because I believe if you go back to a place, you can understand the nature of what's happening to us as a planet and in various countries, you can just, you can see the future that way. And there are pleasant experiences that I've had. Mexico, for example, I would go back at, at any time. I had, I, I had a, a lovely set of experiences there as I recount in the book and I made many friends there. I don't live to travel. Uh, I haven't felt locked down. I haven't, although I must say in this, in the lockdown period, he's been reading Stephen, right? Yep. Um, has been reading my books. So I've been reading Samuel Beckett. And I started right at the beginning with his earliest books, um, Murphy, Watt, Malloy, Malone Dies, The Unnameable, and then the plays, Waiting for Godot, and Endgame, and the other. So, And then I, wrote, I read two biographies of Beckett, one by James Nolson called Damn to Fame, and another called um, by Anthony Cronin, Beckett, the last modernist. So many of us who've been locked down have used this as an opportunity to read and, you know, educate our brain. And, and I suppose imaginatively to experience the world through, through fiction or through, through travel. To hear that someone is a devoted reader of mine, if you, uh, I only, I, 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 I say I only trust, but I really admire people who read more than one book by a writer. And when I read, I, I don't read books, I read writers. Last year, I was reading Rebecca West. She was a lover of H.G. Wells and had a child on. But Rebecca West is a fantastic writer, and I read most of her books. She's a better essayist and traveler, but she wrote the longest, the biggest, <laughs> the best travel book ever written. It's called Black Lamb and Gray Falcon. It's about Yugoslavia. Published 1941, 1942. She took the trip in the late 30s. It's a fantastic book. It's a half a million words. So I read that. <laughs> That'll keep you busy. Yeah, that would. So, our, but, but I, in other words, I read. You got to read more than one. You got to. Yeah. And this at college, they say, well, you're going to read one Dostoevsky and one Henry James and one Dickens. That's baloney. That you you have to do more than that. Our, uh, we get lots of uh, great, nice questions from our readers. El Ellen uh, said that you'd mentioned that you speak Spanish. Do you speak any other languages? I start, When I was in high school, I studied Italian. And then I studied a bit in college. And my first job out of college was in Italy. So I was once able to speak Italian pretty well. My mother is Italian. I used to speak to my grandmother in Italian. So Italian is one of them. My French isn't very good. Uh, my Spanish is okay. It's, you know, serviceable. And when I went to Africa, I had to learn a language. The language is called Chichewa. So Chichewa is spoken in Mozambique, in Malawi, in a bit of um, parts of South Africa and Zimbabwe and Zambia. And I spoke that, I would say, fluently um, because the Peace Corps drummed it into our heads. And then in East Africa, I learned Swahili, which is similar to Chichewa. So Swahili wasn't hard to learn after that. But to speak a language well, you need to be among people who speak it. And you, you can't, you know, being polylingual is, is a wonderful thing, but you really need to concentrate on one. And I don't really regard anyone as being fluent in a language unless they know the layers of it, particularly the subjunctive tense, for example. If you can say, if I had known it was going to rain, I would have brought an umbrella, then you can speak a language. 
Um, we I got a couple of other. Uh, Allison would want to know: Do you and your wife travel together when you're researching a, a travel-related book? And what are the pros and cons of traveling with a spouse? The pros are you have someone there by your side and to snuggle with at night. <laughs> and the cons are: I think it's impossible to write if you travel with another person. So every book that I've written, I've traveled on my own, homesick, but I wake up every morning, I do my notes, and at the end of the day, I don't know where I am, but there's no one there to say, well, where are we gonna stay tonight? Well, I'm hungry, well, I'm worried, I don't feel what I'm doing. Anyway, you, you need to concentrate. And I, I have sometimes have very little idea of what I'm going to be doing that night, where I'm going to stay, where I'm going to eat. But if you travel, with, you have to be kind. You know, travel with your spouse. You you need to be um, uh, solicitous and and helpful and say, well, we're going to have a great meal tonight. But I have no confidence. The other thing is, you can uh, traveling is very at its best is uh, an experience of split decisions. Someone says. You're hungry, you're tired, but someone says, you want to see something really amazing? You want to see something really incredible? And you say, yeah, check it out. Well, it'll take us you know, a couple of hours to get there, but it's a really amazing, whatever. It is. And you say, well, okay, let's do it. But you can't do that. If you're traveling with somebody, you can't, you can't then say, oh, by the way, we're scrapping all the plans. I'm going to go see the biggest alligator in the world or a temple in the jungle or whatever it is. And so it's... It's out of kindness that I travel alone. And I think the downside is it's lonely. Any traveler who says he doesn't get homesick or lonely is crazy and, but, uh, or insensitive. I like traveling with my wife. But I, when I'm traveling to write, uh, she stays home. Uh, so we we partner with a local uh, a locally owned bookstore and, and it's beloved here in Spokane and we always and and we always ask aunties what they would ask you that's which is the name of our box our bookstore and the question is always the same uh, what are you reading right now are, you're still in the, the the group of books that you did, mentioned earlier is it... yeah I'm reading Samuel Beckett I'm reading Samuel Beckett I'm I'm rereading Murphy. And I'm near the end of the Anthony Cronin biography. So I read them both. If I'm reading, like I have a, a, a reading program. I read a big biography. Like I read a big biography of Rebecca West. Then I read her books. I read a big biography of H.G. Wells. Then I read the H.G. Wells books. I did the same thing. I, it's, I'm a autodidact. I, I, I don't, I want to do this in college. I hated English I hated literature classes for that, the selectivity of this saying, we're going to read this book and then we're going to read this other author. And, but I, I wanted to read, just roam through vast tracts of this person's work. I, 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 head of an English department, I, I explained this to a group, a seminar on said at a university, and the head of the department said, well, we don't have as much time to read as you civilians. And I said, what are you talking about? I was so offended by it. I, uh, us civilians, I have no income. I ha I'm just a, I'm an amateur reader. I'm a, I'm a professional writer. He, and he, here's a guy with a good salary, with a chair of English. He's saying, we can't do what you're doing. You have to do that. You have to do that. So what am I reading at the moment is I'm still plowing through uh, Samuel Beckett. I have the four volume, the Grove Centenary Edition, and I have the individual volumes, which I buy online from, for, you know, in used, from uh, used, bookstores, abebooks.com. And that's what I'm reading. Um, and I'm writing a, a book myself. But, what, do, uh, do, can you give us a, a hint what it is? What I'm writing? Well, I started to write um, last April 1st a, 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 a story about two brothers. It's just a family, two, two boys in the family. And, and they have, there's a lot of competition and friction. And um, it's getting, the conflict is getting quite serious at the moment. After, after 300 pages, um, I'm kind of worried about how they're <laughs> going to work this out. But 
<laughs> I previously wrote a book about based on my family called Motherland, one of my personal favorite books. Um, it didn't please members of my family. So writing about brothers, I'd, maybe one of them will, I don't know what they'll say, but that's <laughs> what I'm doing. So yeah, there's Motherland. Uh, everything you need to know about a dysfunctional family. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, this has been so great talking to you. I can't, I can't thank you enough. I, 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 it's just been wonderful. And I, I'm sincere. I really hope you'll come visit us in Spokane. This is not a normal book club. It's like rock concerts. We're going to put 700 people in a theater. We're going to have more fun than we should have uh, talking about nouns and verbs. You can count on me. You can count on me. I would love to come there. There's nothing I like better than meeting people who read, having a conversation with them, and finding out about, out about how they're living their lives. You know, post-pandemic, things are going to be different, but I hope to um, get on the move then. And I look forward to visiting Spokane, a place I've never been. Uh, although I've been to Tacoma, I've been to Seattle. Uh, and, but Spokane's I, way uh, better you can, than that, way better. Way, I mean, not even close, this is so much better. Yeah, I'm just saying that I, I've been in that general direction. But, so, <laughs> I look for, Rob, it's very, it's very nice of you to invite me. Your, your hospitality means a lot to me. I hope that um, the, the people will look at my book. And I would say, it, it's I've got, they got Hotel Honolulu and, and this book. Between both books, um, you'll know quite a lot about the other Hawaii, not the Hawaii of the travel of the of the travel magazines, but uh, but something else. Well, Paul, it has been wonderful. If if, if you don't mind, I, we've had we've got a, a lot of viewers, and 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 I love to give them things. So I'm going to give people a few things, if that's okay. <laughs> Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 uh, I, I uh, uh, yesterday I think I posted a picture of me wearing uh, this mask, and well, not this exact one. It was mine. Um, and and uh, a bunch of people asked how you get them, and uh, so, so, and, and we have ones that haven't been opened, so we were good. So let's draw for that. Who's going to win our mask? Hey, Robin. Okay, Robin, we are going to reach out to you to uh, help you get this. Um, well, not this one. Well, it'll be, it'll be a different one. Uh, uh, the uh, during uh, For those of you who have come to a lot of our book clubs, you know, I love to make shirts and give them away and, and make them for my staff. And everybody who comes to the book club wants the ones that we make for our staff. Well, these are the shirts. Uh, that were made this, this, this during the pandemic, you know, to make sure that it's clear that our newspaper has been essential for a very long time. Let's see. Yeah, a very long time. So who wins this shirt, uh, Jesse? Let's see. All right, Susan. So we'll reach out to you. Make sure you get, you get that. I got, I got another shirt. This was what we gave the staff on election night to make sure that everyone knows that we've been covering elections for a long time and we're quite good at it. So let's see who wins this. All right, Nancy, so you got that. So for those of you who are longtime subscribers, you know that every summer we commission uh, short uh, uh, fiction stories about a, a similar topic. And we get really great authors uh, to do it. And But last year's was the biggest. And we, we had some of the best authors across the Pacific Northwest all write short stories for our newspaper. And for the first time ever, we decided to compile them as a book that, that also benefits the local Spark, uh, uh, Spark Central, which helps young people who can't always afford uh, to get uh, arts training and those sorts of things so so that all the proceeds for this book goes to that uh but somebody's getting it for free tonight and let's see all right sylvia all right for those of you who've come been coming to our book club for the last two or three years you know i always end with the same same gift um uh, about five or six years ago, we we took a, a, a line drawing of our building. Most of you know we 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 
our newspaper is published in a 140 year old building and uh, and we redrew it to recreate this line drawing and we loved it so much we would give copies away to it to people uh, and then we decided wouldn't it be fun if we made it a warhol so so and this is the one that everybody wants to win is this so this print you can't buy it you have to win it and who won it jesse Man, Robin, I don't know. We should take you to Vegas. It feels like you're winning a lot. So, so look, I, I can't thank Paul enough. You all have to go read this. It's it's wonderful, and, and I didn't get to ask him about it, but, but it, the, you know, there's stuff in here you wouldn't normally see in, in, in travel books. Paul, I meant to ask, uh, uh, what, what's more fun, writing a travel book or a sex scene? Because that was my first thought when I read this. Uh, <laughs> So, so thank you again, Paul. Well, you got to come back, and everybody go go to Auntie's and and buy this. So uh, let me kind of wrap it up. So thank you all for tonight. Next Monday, we're back with our Young Adult Literature Club, uh, and we're we're it's going to be great. We have the 2018 National Teacher of the Year, Mandy Manning, from here in Spokane, in conversation with Sabina Khan, and it's it's going to be just a, a great. Uh, discussion. Then on, uh, we're we're gonna get, we're gonna go to the com community forum side of Northwest Passages and have a lunch and learn session with our city hall writer Adam Shanks and the, the Mayor Woodward from here in Spokane. That'll be on Thursday, twenty second at eleven thirty. So all of these events are, are are on our website archived, so you can you can watch this again. We actually have more people watch them on the reruns than the live ones. So come watch any of them you missed. And, and thank you all so much for supporting local journalism. Uh, this is this is how we fund a big part of what we do is this book club, and it means so much to me. So Paul, thank you again. Come to Spokane, and and yeah, you'll you'll see uh, a bunch of other people who love words as much as you do. Thank you, Rob, and thank uh, uh, everyone who's watching this, who cares about a book, who read. God bless you, and um, I look forward to seeing you at some point when this long national nightmare, global nightmare, <laughs> is over. Agreed. Well, thank you all for watching tonight, and I will see you again soon.